Today's video is going to cover medications for alcohol use disorder, specifically medications that might assist certain individuals in reducing alcohol consumption, reducing cravings for alcohol, or the reinforcing effects from alcohol, and to hopefully increase longer stretches of sobriety. My name is Dr. Andrew Kim, and I'm a board certified psychiatrist. And again, please understand that these videos are for educational purposes. I am not your personal physician. I am not giving you direct medical advice. This is to raise awareness, start the conversation, and for educational purposes only. Please consult with your own personal physician, nurse practitioner, licensed healthcare professional before you make any decisions about your medication regimens. So again, I want to focus specifically today on meds that are meant for alcohol use disorder very specifically. So we're not talking about meds for depression, anxiety, OCD, etc. And those are very important because at the end of the day, part of what most individuals are going to need to do is to uh, tackle the root cause. What are the root causes of things that are maybe driving the alcohol use, right? So that's a very different discussion, meaning there are obviously many treatments, both therapy-wise and medication-wise for depression and for anxiety. Today's video is focused on prescription meds specifically to try to reduce alcohol use itself, consumption, cravings, and to enhance sobriety. Okay, so first of all, let's stratify different severities of alcohol use disorder. For milder cases, so for mild alcohol use disorder, actually most professional societies don't recommend the use of prescription medications like we mentioned earlier. For these situations, therapy, counseling, support groups like Alcoholics Anonymous, Smart Recovery, uh, structured intensive outpatient programs like intensive outpatient programs or IOPs or partial hospital programs like PHPs. These are the psychosocial interventions that are considered primary recommendations because clinical trials and clinical research actually don't provide robust evidence for the use of prescription meds in these milder forms of milder severity alcohol use disorder. So let's get that out of the way. I'm not here to kind of push prescription meds. In the ideal world, if we can get away without using meds, I'd love it. But we're talking now in our next conversation about moderate or severe alcohol use disorder. And now evidence does suggest that in these situations and kind of the more severe end of the spectrum, that the combination of what I mentioned before, psychosocial interventions plus certain prescription medications may actually have more effective outcomes than either one used alone. Again, for moderate to severe alcohol use disorder. So today we're gonna to talk about two medications that are considered first line treatment in alcohol use disorder. First of all, we're gonna talk about naltrexone. Now most of you may actually be familiar with naltrexone in the context of opioid use disorder because this is a medication that blocks opioid receptors. So why are we talking about this in the use of alcohol use disorder? Because this is also approved, FDA approved, in alcohol use disorder. And we believe that this works for a couple different reasons. Number one, because it binds to certain opioid or endorphin receptors, we believe this actually blocks or dulls the reinforcing effects and the feelings one can get from alcohol. So it just doesn't feel as good, as pleasurable, as reinforcing. So we believe that's one of the mechanisms. The second mechanism is it does seem to reduce cravings for alcohol, which translates to just overall decreased amount of alcohol consumed. And we've seen this in studies repeatedly. Now, because of these factors and because there's an ease of dosing, meaning it's a once a day oral medication or there's actually a long acting once a month injection version, and because of the fact that this can actually be started in certain folks even while someone is drinking. So you can even start this during that contemplative phase of change when someone's contemplating wanting to start uh, cutting back on their drinking, wanting to maybe start going into detox. Um, and you can start it then versus waiting for that all to happen first in certain individuals, okay? Now, what are some of the roadblocks that we can face when using naltrexone? Well, uh, side effects themselves, very common side effects, sadly, are things like nausea, nausea and vomiting. 
And obviously someone who's going through the alcohol detox process or weaning off of alcohol because of the withdrawal process may already be having nausea, diarrhea, and a bunch of other gastrointestinal issues. So that could be a rate limiting factor. Now another problem is naltrexone can be somewhat taxing on the liver sometimes and it can lead to um, some liver irritation and inflammation. And we're now giving it to a population who already has other reasons, alcohol itself, that can lead to liver inflammation, uh, acute hepatitis. So one of the contraindications is to not start it in someone who's having an acute hepatitis bout, okay? Um, and finally, because it is an opioid blocker, for those who are on opioids and who truly need them for acute pain, this can block the effects of opioids. So there are a few contraindications. But like I said, if someone, you know, does find this beneficial and finds it helpful, and maybe let's say there's a compliance issue or a compliance concern, once you've established that side effects are tolerable and doable and it's helping you, you can switch as an individual, you can switch to a long acting injection where you get a once a month injection in the muscle, usually in the buttock or the gluteal muscle, and take a shot once a month rather than having to risk maybe forgetting taking your pill every day. So it comes in multiple forms. And look, I know this is not perfect. It doesn't help everyone, but it does help a decent percentage of patients. And if you or your loved ones is struggling over and over and you are in that moderate to severe alcohol use disorder category, why wouldn't you want to throw the kitchen sink at it? Therapy, counseling, programs, and meds to see if we can help you, help you during this terrible, difficult process to help you change in a healthier direction. And then later on, consider pulling back and then getting off the naltrexone at a certain point. That's my mentality. Now, an alternative first line treatment is a medication called a acamprosate. Now, a acamprosate helps balance or modulate two different chemical signals in the brain, glutamate, which is the excitatory signal and GABA, which is kind of that slow down signal. Okay, and it kind of helps balance the ratio of these two signals, which is what is proposed to believe how it leads to reductions in alcohol use. Now, patients who have taken uh, a camprosate, we have done meta-analyses, anal analyzing 18 different studies combined to try to get some more powerful data and we've seen increased continuous abstinence, decreased alcohol cravings in patients who were compliant and taking uh, a camprosate after they had gone through detox versus the group that just got a placebo. So we do have data to say that this can be an alternative first line treatment to naltrexone for those who maybe um, aren't in a position because their liver enzymes um, are elevated and they can't take uh, naltrexone in that setting. Uh, maybe they are on opioids and can't take naltrexone because they need pain control. Um, maybe naltrexone didn't work and what are the next steps? And this may be that next step in the treatment algorithm. Now, what are some of the issues, uh, common side effects? Well, common side effects, highest frequency are gonna be things like diarrhea, some nervousness and anxiety can actually happen as well as tiredness and fatigue. Now, the other nuisance is a camprosate is not a once a day medication. You have to take it three times a day, at least what the textbooks want you to do. Um, so why is that a big deal? It's like, well, what's the difference? I take it once a day, three times a day. Trust me, trust me when I say adding more than one dose a day raises the, the chances of non-compliance. I mean, I'm a physician and if you told me to take a 10 day course of antibiotics, there's a good chance I'm gonna miss a few doses. And that's even if it's a once a day medication. So when you ask someone to take a med multiple times a day, trust me when I say, as mundane as that sounds, that could be a problem. So compliance can be an issue with a camprosate. And obviously I'm stating the obvious here, but uh, accessibility. Now, fortunately, these meds, because they've been around long enough at this point, um, are generic, have become more accessible as they were in the past, um, where before even getting this covered could be a problem, whether through commercial insurance or Medicaid. But I'm not saying it's perfect, but it has gotten better compared to like a decade ago, okay? So again, these are you know just options that you can use as first line treatment. These aren't the only option, but these have more robust evidence to back up their use. 
in terms of the balance of efficacy and weight against side effect profiles. Now, there are plenty of other things, but we could spend hours talking about secondary, second line options. But most professional societies um, and research would say these are the top first line agents to use in alcohol use disorder. So hopefully, if you were not aware that these were even options, you found this video helpful, um, or if you've been contemplating them, please put some questions in the comments below about, again, not personal medical questions, but general questions. And if you want me to do more thorough videos about any of these two options, let me know, and I can do dedicated videos on those. Thank you again for tuning in. This is Dr. Andrew Kim. Please like, subscribe, let me know if you find these videos about addiction recovery helpful for you.